Welcome, in this video I'm going to talk a bit about the Pearson chi-square test for goodness of fit, which can be used to determine from a single nominal variable if the percentages are all equal. Warning, this is not about the Pearson chi-square test for independence. The best way probably to explain this test is probably by simply using an example. I have a few categories uh, of marital status, uh, ranging from married to never married, and the number of people that are, have actually selected those options, and next to that, the percentages. Now, as you might notice here, we have almost already 50%, which is quite different from the 4.1%, but we want to actually test if these differences would also occur, not only in the sample, but also in the population. So, if all percentages would have been the same, what would then be that percentage? Well, in this case, we have five categories. They need to sum up to 100%. So 100 divided by 5 would mean 20% each. Then the next question is, how many respondents would there then be in each category? Well, in that case, the total number of respondents is 1,941. That was up here. And... 20% of 1,941 is 388.2. So we would expect, if the percentages would have all been equal, 388.2. You might have noticed, by the way, that these do not exactly add up to 100%, but that's due to rounding errors. Then, if these differences, if there are differences, because, well, here we have 388, that's what we would have expected, and we actually have 972. So there are differences for each of them. If those differences are big, then most likely they will also be different in the population. So what I've done here is I've calculated simply the differences between the frequency and the expected each time. And so if these differences are considered to be big, in total actually, then we might conclude that in the population, the percentages might also not be equal. So the big question is, when will it then be considered big? That's where this brilliant guy comes into play, Mr. Carl Pearson. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 1936, but luckily for us, he wrote a small paper in the 1900s on the criterion that a given system of deviations, etc., etc., etc. Now, don't worry, you don't have to read that article, but in essence, what he concluded was that if the percentages would all be equal in the population, then the chi-square values of all possible samples would form a so-called chi-square distribution. So there's something here about chi-square values. Um, that's something that he picked up on. And there's something about those forming a so-called distribution. So what is a chi-square value? Or at least how do we obtain one? And uh, what's so significant about then knowing that they form a specific type of distribution. So in the previous one, we mentioned that if the percentages are all equal in the population, the chi-square value of all possible samples would form a chi-square distribution. Now, we can actually calculate such a chi-square value for our single sample. And then, thanks to Mr. Pearson, we know that the chi-square values from a chi-square, uh, form a chi-square distribution. And with those two given, we can actually then determine, and this is gonna be quite tricky, the chance or the probability of getting a chi-square value such as in our sample, or an even bigger one, if indeed those percentages are equal in the population. Now that's actually what is uh, quite a tricky sentence, so read it carefully, but it does work out. So chi-square distribution it usually actually has this kind of shape. Uh, it depends a little bit on, on how many categories you have. And the thing with distributions is often that it's not so much about the height of a single point, but that is actually, as indicated here, about the area of a specific uh, interval. 
So we can calculate a chi-square value for our specific sample. And then actually we're interested in the area or an even bigger one, so up to there. And we actually want then to know the area of the uh, this area under the curve on this interval. So this whole area, how big is that? Um, because that area will actually be the probability of having a value such as the one we have in our sample or an even bigger one. Now, luckily, we don't actually often have to calculate those areas all by hand. In the past, people used often tables to do this. Um, if your professor is still uh, forcing you to use a uh, table for this, I'll, I'll create a separate video for you. But most often we use a program like SPSS to get some results, or we use uh, perhaps R, or we use perhaps even still Excel. Uh, I have separate videos on how to obtain these results with each program. Uh, I have a link later on uh, in this video to, to them. But what's most important is that all of them actually show either what they call in SPSS significance or what they call in R the p-values. And as you can see, they are all about a zero in this example. So they all luckily come up with the same result. And that is actually that probability I just mentioned that we were looking for. Let's do some concluding. This is where things might become a bit tricky. We already discussed that the p-value or significant in di for this test is the chance of getting a chi-square value, as in our sample, or an even bigger one, if indeed the percentages are equal in the population. Then, in the example, this chance was about zero. So it was actually below 0 0.0005. It's actually never zero, but... So either we have a very unlikely scenario and have just picked some very rare cases, or the assumption that the percentages are equal in the population is probably incorrect. This is our assumption about the population at the moment. This is sometimes also known as the null hypothesis. Now the convention is, is, uh, is to state that if the p-value or the significance is below 0.05, we conclude that the assumption is probably incorrect. So in this case, our example conclusion would be that the assumption that percentages in the population are equal is probably incorrect. So we can therefore state that they are significantly different. So this is quite brilliant from Mr. Carl Pearson, but there's a one small catch. Um, no cell should have an expected count less than five. You can see, for example, Peck and DeVore about this. It has to do with that the chi-square distribution is a summation of a standardized normal distribution and et cetera, et cetera. Quite tricky to fully go into, but um, one criteria is that no cell should have an expected count less than five. Now, in our case, we already saw that the expected count was 388, so shouldn't be a problem but if you do have uh, an expected count less than five then do a few things check first of all if you really are using a nominal variable and not an ordinal one because there are different tests for ordinal variables you probably want to know something else you could perhaps combine some categories where the scores are very low then also report that clearly in your uh, final article or your thesis uh, that you've done so but um, yeah, if, for example, uh, you've done ask people about countries and a, a few countries were hardly ever selected, you might want to group them into a category other. Or you could use something known as an exact multinomial test. Um, but that's an entirely different test. And usually uh, the chi-square test is more commonly used. So if you can use the chi-square test, uh, it's actually preferred. Once you do have your results, you might want to report them properly in, for example, APA style, the American Psychological Association, uh, using their sixth manual, uh, sixth edition uh, of their publication manual. There are a few relevant sections here. Uh, at 4.42, they say that you do not give a reference for statistics in common use. So that means you do not have to give a citation for the Pearson chi-square test in itself. So you don't have to write down somewhere Pearson 1900 and refer to that article I just uh, showed you. 
Another thing is that you should include sufficient information to allow the reader to fully understand the analysis conducted. And this is a bit fake, but luckily they show a few examples of tests. So we can work on that and actually derive something that you will commonly also see in other articles for this test. And last but not least, we are allowed to use the Greek symbol for chi. Um, uh, it's one of the standard APA symbols, so we can actually use that. So how does one report the results? Well, in general, you use a, a chi-square symbol, and then you fill out the degrees of freedom, then an N in italic, and then the sample size, the chi-square value, and again, the P in italic, and then that's actually value. Uh, with three decimals and no leading zero. So there's just going to be dot 003, for example. So the DF is the degrees of freedom, which is usually the number of categories minus one. The sample size, uh, that's the total number, uh, number of respondents that actually answered this question. The chi-square value that has been calculated and the p-value. Those are the only values you need. And then you can actually uh, fill out something like uh, this one. Small note, if the p-value is uh, 0, 0.000, um, you usually report it as p smaller than 0.001. Um, how to obtain uh, these orange values? Uh, of course, in the reporting, you just use your standard font size. You don't change them uh, uh, like I did here. This was just to emphasize how to obtain those values. Uh, I've, uh, I've actually on my website, um, and that I'll show you on the next page. Where to look in your output uh, for all those values I've just shown. I actually have that on my website, but it depends a bit on which program you're using. So I'm just going to show you where you can find it. It's all for free. Just go to peterstatistics.com. Um, once there, uh, make sure you click on one variable and then a nominal variable. Then select uh, in the left hand menu test and, that, and then actually click uh, on this one up here which will show you how to perform the test. Um, once you click on that, it will actually have a few different options. If, for example, you want to see how to, it's being done with SPSS and you want to use the one sample uh, technique in SPSS, it will actually show you a video on how to do that and where to uh, read and find all the values needed for the reporting. I have a small thumbnail there. And if you click on the thumbnail, it will open up uh, immediately showing you where all of those uh, uh, all of those data points are, uh, th those values like degrees of freedom, etc. Last but not least, uh, there are some alternative tests for this. Um, there's also a G-test, also known as a likelihood ratio test for goodness of fit. Um, it has as a, it's usually an additive test, so it can uh, be actually used then later for other tests as well, if you're planning on doing something like that, but um, it's far less known. So most often you want to show your reader a test that they might be familiar with. So the Pearson chi-square test of uh, goodness of fit is probably still preferred. And like I already mentioned, there's also an exact test known as the exact multinomial test. Uh, a bit tricky, but it's um, yeah, it can be useful if, for example, you do not meet the criteria that all the counts have to be, uh, all the expected counts have to be below five. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, learned a little bit about how the uh, Pearson chi-square goodness of fit test actually works.